see all of you here again this evening. Do you remember the first time you saw the moon? I do. I remember the very first time I saw it. I was about eight years old, oddly enough. I had poor vision as a boy. It took us a long time to get my prescription just right for my glasses. I wear contacts now. But we were in Lebanon and got, went to the doctor's office, got my new glasses, driving on the way home. And it was a clear winter night. It was still kind of early, but it was dark, you know, around about January or February. And I was driving home and I looked out the window and for the first time I saw the moon just as clear as a bell. And it was beautiful. And I looked at it the whole way home. I didn't want to squander that opportunity. It's the first time I'd seen it. Remember seeing it anyway, clearly. And so I wanted to make sure I, I took it in. And Mom made notice of that, and she mentions it to this day. But I watched it, the 20-minute ride home, because I didn't want to miss that opportunity. You're here tonight with a grand opportunity to make a change spiritually, to become stronger, to think about some things, to do something different. So tonight, we are going to talk about how we handle the opportunities that come our way. You're making the most tonight of being here. You know, you could have stayed at home. You, you know, you didn't have to come, but you chose to because you said this is a good opportunity. Same thing this morning. Same thing Wednesday and at our other activities that we have. You take advantage of those opportunities. There's many more in this life that you can do a few things with. And that's what we're going to talk about tonight. Because there's a lot of things that you can do with the opportunities that are thrown your way. First off, some people actually abuse opportunity. Let's look at 1 Samuel chapter 9, please. 1 Samuel chapter 9. Saul, Old Testament Saul in 1 Samuel chapter 9, had an opportunity that came to him, that came his way. And we're going to see what he did with that opportunity. This is the early days of Saul's life in 1 Samuel chapter 9. And I would encourage you to go back and read this entire story. It kind of fleshes it out more, but we're going to focus on the highlights this evening. 1 Samuel chapter 9 and verse 3. Now the donkeys of Kish, Saul's father, were lost. So Kish said to his son, Saul, Take now with you one of the servants and arise. Go search for the donkeys. It's funny how opportunities sometimes come our way. And in Saul's opportunity, it starts with the fact that he was sent to look for his father's donkeys. He was probably taking care of, taking care of them before they got... He's probably wanting to let them loose. I don't know. He's probably tired of taking care of them. But he had to go find them all the same. So off he goes with one of their servants. And after a while, we see down in verse 5 that Saul, he wanted to go back home because they couldn't find the donkeys. Let's read that. When they came to the land of Zuph, Saul said to his servant who was with him, Come and let us return, or else my father will cease to be concerned about the donkeys and will become anxious for us. So Saul is worried about that. You know, you're out for a long time, and your parents start to worry. My dad tells a story about how he got a blanket and a can of beans and was gone for three days. His parents didn't know where he was because that's how, that's how they did it then. Well, Saul was worried about what his dad would think of him. And so he tells the servant, hey, we need to go back. But the servant suggested that they go see the prophet Samuel. We read that in verse 6. He said to him, Behold now, there is a man of God in this city, and the man is held in honor. All that he says surely comes true. Now let us go there. Perhaps he can tell us about our journey on which we have set out. Something, I don't know if it was God speaking to the servant, but something told him to tell Saul, hey, let's go, let's go speak to Samuel. See, this opportunity starts to come out. Nothing miraculous up to this point, but simply rather the providence of God leading Saul to an opportunity. And Samuel, throughout this passage, was expecting Saul we read about how God instructed Samuel to make Saul a prince over Israel. So Samuel, the prophet, was ready to instruct Saul on this matter. 
And this was a very important matter to be sure because the Israelites in these moments that we're reading right here are moving from a judge system to a kingdom. Are moving from one ruled by judges and instructed by them and moving to a kingdom system where Saul would be king. What we see though is throughout the story of Saul that he proved unworthy. He took that which God had given and used it to serve his own pride. 1 Samuel chapter 13, let's look there. 1 Samuel chapter 13, verses 13 and 14. I would hope that any of us would be willing and able to listen and and search for opportunities afforded us through the providence of God and, and would work to make the most of that and not abuse them. But Saul is doing that very thing. We read that here, 1 Samuel 13 and verse 13. Samuel said to Saul, You have acted foolishly. You have not kept the commandment of the Lord your God, which He commanded you. For now the Lord would have established your kingdom over Israel forever. But now your kingdom shall not endure. The Lord has sought out for Himself a man after His own heart, and the Lord has appointed him as ruler over His people, because you have not kept what the Lord commanded you. He abused his opportunity. Given full advantage. Here you go, Saul. Here's a kingdom. I want you to do your best with it because I trust you with it. And what did Saul do? He abused that opportunity. And we read much more of his story throughout this good book. And in 1 Samuel chapter 31, Saul takes his own life because he didn't like how things were going in his life. And he, he, he murders himself, falls on his own sword. Saul abused his opportunity. Well, so did Judas. Judas is another example. He was called to the apostleship. In Mark chapter 3, we read of that. He might have been one of the twelve in in Acts chapter 2 who was preaching. The other eleven disciples were were up and they were preaching and speaking in tongues and and everybody heard them and and what was being said in their own language. Are these men drunk? And, And no. And the men are looking around and they're preaching and they're excited. And I wonder... How often Judas crossed their minds. I wonder how they dealt with that grief. Some were probably angry, no doubt about it. But I'm sure in these moments like this and at other times that Judas was on their mind. He abused his opportunity as well. Psalm chapter 41 makes us think of Judas. Even my close friend in whom I trusted, who ate my bread, has lifted up His heel against me. Perhaps you're given a grand opportunity to do something great for the Lord, to do something great for somebody else. Don't abuse it. You are called here tonight to be a Christian, to be a follower of God. Don't squander that opportunity as well. Judas was given an opportunity, and he also abused it. What opportunities, though, are you abusing? Opportunities to use your talents for God, perhaps. Opportunities to be a stronger husband. Opportunities to be a stronger wife or a spouse or a parent. Don't abuse those opportunities. Every moment is so precious. And with each gray hair in my beard and on my face, I am reminded of that every single day. As I look at you and myself and my children, every single moment is so precious. May we not abuse the opportunities that we're given. Because who knows where they're coming from? Who knows what God is trying to do with us, with the opportunities, with the skills, with the talents, with the time that He has given us. Don't abuse those opportunities. Some people insult opportunities. You might also say slight them. Kind of turn their nose away from it. Let's look at Acts chapter 13, please. Acts chapter 13, here we read about the Jews at Antioch. Acts chapter 13, beginning with verse 44. The next Sabbath, nearly the whole city assembled to hear the word of the Lord. But when the Jews saw the crowds, they were filled with jealousy and began contradicting the things spoken by Paul and were blaspheming. Paul, at this point in his ministry, is turning to the Gentiles. We see this throughout Scripture where Jesus says, you know, we've got to go to the Jews first, let's handle that. 
then they change and they go to all the rest of the world, not forgetting the Jews, of course, but continuing on to the rest of the world, to the Gentiles. This angered the Jews. Verse 46, Paul and Barnabas spoke out boldly and said, it was necessary that the Word of God be spoken to you first. So they're talking to the Jews. We came and spoke to you first. Since you repudiate it and judge yourselves unworthy of eternal life, behold, we are turning to the Gentiles. Opportunities insulted or ignored are withdrawn and passed on to others. They said here, we turn to the Gentiles. We tried to teach you, we tried to show you the way, but you wouldn't listen. You ever talk to a hard-headed person? That's kind of what this is like. Jesus spoke to the Jews. The apostles spoke to the Jews. They were first in line. I like being first in line. And they were trying to teach them and show them the way, and they ignored it. So, okay, well, we're going to go to others. And we're going to teach other people, and they're going to want to know more about it. People like the woman at the well, she's going to want to know more about it. And other people, because they want salvation. Because they want a better life spiritually. Because they want their sins forgiven. But, but the Jews, in this particular passage, didn't want anything to do with it. Don't insult the opportunity whenever it is afforded you. We read of other examples of people who insult opportunities. Acts chapter 24, we read of Felix. But some days later, Felix arrived with Drusilla, his wife, who was a Jewess, and sent for Paul and heard him speak about faith in Christ Jesus. Felix brought Paul to him, to his, to his, uh, to his throne, and, and spoke to him about faith, but as he was discussing righteousness, self-control, and the judgment to come, Felix became frightened. What did he become frightened of, I suppose? I suppose the same thing that many of us might be frightened of when approached or addressed by someone about things that are wrong in our life. Fearful we've been found out, fearful that we might have to change, fearful that we might have to change our friends, fearful that we might lose our political standings as perhaps Felix felt here. But he was frightened. And so when you're, in, when you're frightened about opportunity, that's an insult to it. It's an insult to God who sent His Son to die so that you wouldn't have to live in sin anymore. But Felix said, go away for the present, and when I find time, I will summon you. When I find time, indeed. Time is what people think that they have. And we've got time. You know, you look back a few weeks ago when we met on this very evening, perhaps, and, and you think, yeah, you know, since then I, I've had time to think about it. You have. But that time may run out this evening. You may pass from this life, maybe a car accident, maybe some unfortunate health circumstance, and you pass on from this life. And you have insulted the opportunities to change your life. And so you've ignored those. We read of Agrippa as well. King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know that you do. Agrippa replied to Paul, in a short time, you will persuade me to become a Christian. He was almost persuaded. We read, we sing about, almost persuaded. You almost got me, Paul. You almost got me, Dale. You almost got me. You almost made me become a Christian. That almost is only in horseshoes, okay? That's the only time almost counts. You're either in or you're out when we talk about Christianity. You're either there or you're not when we talk about being a servant of Christ. You either obey Him or you don't. Stop wasting your time and stop insulting the opportunity. If you were to see Christ, if we were to go back in time somehow and, and you saw the life that He lived, sometimes seeing something has such a more powerful effect than just hearing about it or reading about it. What would you do? Would you change your life immediately? Certainly I believe you would. You saw Him doing miracles. You saw Him doing a lot of things. What would you do? I hope then you would not insult that opportunity, but rather you would take hold of it. Because I called and you refused, I stretched out my hand and no one paid attention. And you neglected all my counsel and did not want my reproof. I will also laugh at your calamity. I will mock when your dread comes. There are so many opportunities for people to change their life. There's a hand of the life-saving Savior reaching out to you. And so many people say, no, not yet. 
adrift in the world of sin. They continue to, to bat the lifesaver away. They continue to push him away and push him away. And they insult those opportunities, thinking they have more and more time. How many opportunities have you dismissed in this life? How many opportunities have you turned away? Passages like this make us think, this is the remainder of Proverbs 1, when your dread comes like a storm and your calamity comes like a whirlwind, when distress and anguish come upon you, then they will call on me, but I will not answer. They will seek me diligently, but they will not find me. When you think you're okay, you don't do anything about it. So if you know that opportunity is here and that opportunity is tonight, please make the most of it. Don't, don't wait till it's due, too late. Because when you finally seek God, you might be pretty far away from Him. You might be so far away from Him, in fact, you, you find it difficult to find your way back. Now we know the story of the prodigal son that you can always find your way back. But I've seen people so deep in sin, they themselves in their brain and in their heart can't turn back because they've insulted so many opportunities. So don't miss an opportunity this evening by pushing it away, knowing that you should respond, whether publicly or privately, knowing you should do something about it. And don't turn your back on the opportunity given tonight. Some people take their opportunity. We're reminded of the children of Israel at the Red Sea. The Red Sea in front of them. Pharaoh's chariots behind them. Bearing down on them. They could probably hear the galloping of the horses on its way. See the glimmer of the chariots and of the spears. What do we do, Moses? What do we do? And Moses goes to the Red Sea and he, with the power of God, he parts it. And what did they do? They walked across. They took that opportunity. I don't know. We've got we to gotta think about it. I don't know, maybe we should form a committee to decide if the land's really dry enough. Maybe, maybe we should you know, branch off and some of us try to wade across. Or Some of you are strong swimmers. You're thinking about it too much. Sometimes people do that. Sometimes people overcomplicate their spiritual life. Here is water. What hinders me to be baptized comes to my mind at this point. What hinders me from changing my life tonight? Only myself does. And perhaps the hold that Satan has on me. Some people take their responsibility. And the children of Israel did just that when they walked across the Red Sea. Also Lydia in Acts chapter 16. Let's look here. A New Testament example of a woman who made the most of an opportunity that came her way. Acts chapter 16, beginning with verse 13. And on the Sabbath day, we went outside the gate to a riverside where we were supposing that there would be a place of prayer. And we sat down and began speaking to the women who had assembled. There's an opportunity. People come out, they come about, and, and they're seated, and there, there are, are women here. They had assembled. You know, let's talk about God for a little while. A woman named Lydia from the city of Thyatira, a seller of purple fabrics, a worshiper of God, was listening. And the Lord opened her heart to respond to the things spoken by Paul. Every time I'm up here, every time a speaker is up here or, or in class, you know, in one way or another, we pray that very thing. That the Lord open our hearts to respond. That the Lord will soften our hearts. There's nothing like a hard heart that will keep the Word of God from getting in. So if a heart is softened, if a heart is opened up, these life-changing words will do what they were intended to do. Change your life. Give you the life that you need. Give you the life that you wish for. Give you the, the complete and perfect life. Well, this happened to Lydia. And when she and her household had been baptized, she urged us, saying, If you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come into my house and stay. And she prevailed upon us. Nothing like a woman who wants to have you in, as a host, <laughs> as a guest in her house, right? And that's what she did. You know, she loved these people, these people who have brought salvation to her and to her family and to her friends. And she was moved by it. She took that opportunity that that was happening, that was right there in front of her, and she made the very most of it. Also, we read of the jailer, just a few verses over, starting in verse 25, but about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying 
and singing hymns of praise to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. And suddenly there came a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken. And immediately all the doors were opened, and everyone's chains were unfastened. So this miracle occurred where the prisoners were set free. When the jailer awoke and saw the prison doors open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself, supposing that the prisoners had escaped. But Paul cried out with a loud voice, saying, Do not harm yourself, for we are all here. So the jailer was about to take the opportunity to kill himself because he would be killed for letting the prisoners escape. Paul didn't take the opportunity to escape and win his freedom because he saw an opportunity to win someone over for Christ. And he knew this was the way to do it. And he called for lights and rushed in, and trembling with fear, he fell down before Paul and Silas. And after he brought them out, he said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? The jailer is taking this opportunity. He's going out and seizing it. They said, Believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved, you and your household. And they spoke the word of the Lord to him together with all who were in his house. So they went, Paul and the rest are making more of this moment, making more of this opportunity, not just teaching the jailer, but teaching everyone there. And he took them that very hour of the night, washed their wounds, and immediately he was baptized, he and all his household. And he brought them into his house and set food before them and rejoiced greatly, having believed in God with his whole household. The jailer took the opportunity as well. Do you take opportunities afforded to you? Opportunities to pray for someone. Opportunities to reach someone with your faith. To hear someone talk and you can tell how miserable they are just based on how they live. And you know that they need the love of Christ. They need the forgiving Gospel. Do you take that opportunity to say something to them about that? So that it might change their life the way the opportunities were changed here. It's that person's responsibility, no doubt, to... to to have a desire to learn about God, but it is our responsibility as children of God to take that Word to them as well. Some people seek opportunity. Acts chapter 8, let's turn there as we read about Philip. Some people see the opportunity and it's there. Sometimes people kind of make it happen. They seek it out. They're self-motivated. They want to make a change. They want to see a change in their life and they start seeking those things out. Acts chapter 8 and verse 26. But an angel of the Lord spoke to Philip, saying, Get up and go south to the roads that descend from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a desert road. So he got up and went, and there was an Ethiopian eunuch, a court official of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who was in charge of all her treasure, and he had come to Jerusalem to worship. And he was returning and sitting in his chariot, and he was reading the prophet Isaiah. Then the Spirit said to Philip, Go up and join this chariot. Philip ran up and heard him reading Isaiah the prophet and said, Do you understand what you're reading? And he said, Well, how could I unless someone guides me? And he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. Philip was led by the angel. And he looked for where he was being led, and he made the most of it. He sees this this eunuch there, and he goes up and gets in the chariot and teaches him, and they study for a while, study from the book of Isaiah. And the eunuch said, here is water, what hinders me from being baptized? They go down into it, and the eunuch himself takes that opportunity to become a Christian as well. Philip, by the leading of the angel, got up and sought after an opportunity. We, being led by the Word of God, by the Spirit that speaks to us through His Word, should seek opportunities to find people who are willing to listen. This wasn't just a stranger that that Philip walked up to and said, hey, I think you might like to talk about the Bible. No, the eunuch was actually already reading. He was already studying from Scripture. I see students all the time at my school. They have a Bible in their hand. Isn't that strange? Got good parents or something. I don't know. I don't know where they go to church. I don't know where they attend. But they'll have a Bible of some kind. And I'll stop them and I'll say, oh, I'll check out the translation. know a little bit about that. And, and I'll, I'll talk to them about that some. And I, you know, I'll mention I'm a, I'm a minister here. Or they'll have you know, some other form of, of uh, 
uh, Christian literature. You know, that's happened a few times over the last year or two. But let me tell you, they need that Word of God in schools in a big way. And our students can well take it. You know, they can take it. Don't say that, that prayer is not in school anymore. Teachers can't get up and start leading it necessarily, but students can take it. Students can definitely take the Word of God and they can pray and they can express their faith. Don't let anybody tell you you can't do that. Because it's in those moments that you might find opportunity as a student, or perhaps as a teacher such as myself, to talk to someone about their faith. Other people sought opportunity. Let's look and see about the Greeks in John chapter 12. John chapter 12 and verse 20, the Greeks here are seeking Jesus. John chapter 12 and verse 20, Now there were some Greeks among those who were going up to worship at the feast. These then came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida of Galilee, and began to ask him, saying, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. That's what Philip saw when he saw the eunuch reading from Isaiah. That's what I see when I see students looking into their Bibles occasionally at school. And that's what Philip saw here when the Greeks came to him and they said, we wish to see Jesus. <clears throat> Jesus is the medicine that this world needs in more ways than one. And if people would seek Him, they'd run into a faithful child of God. They'd run into somebody who wanted to teach them about following Him, about being a Christian. They would see those people, but we've got to be looking for them as well. We wish to see Jesus. I don't know if more beautiful words have ever been spoken. I wish to see Jesus. I hope you want to see the same thing as well. I hope you want to see it in those at your school, at your place of work. Here, here at the church building, I wish to see Jesus. And I hope that you show others that. Because that's what other people want to see. It's tough to, tough to do sometimes because His standard's pretty high. But whenever you strive to live for Him and people truly see Jesus living in you, I'm going to tell you it makes a huge difference in their life. It makes a tremendous difference in their life. And the more that we take opportunity to call out the difference He's made in our lives, the more opportunities we might create on our own. Matthew 13, verses, 30, or Matthew 13, verses 45 <clears throat> and 46. Have you ever you know, been out? I know Brother Allen searches for arrowheads, or perhaps some of you might do metal detecting or something like that. You like, uh, you like finding treasures, don't you? Matthew 13 and verse 45 says this, Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking pearls. And upon finding one of pearl of great value, he went and sold all that he had and bought it. Our Christian life, the opportunity to live for Jesus, is like that pearl. That pearl of great price that we are willing to give up anything to go and, and get our Christianity, live for Jesus, so that we might show others this same opportunity. We also read of Cornelius and Peter in Acts chapter 10. Peter had a vision, and Cornelius had a vision as well that brought them together. What brought them together was the fact that the Gentiles, as we mentioned earlier, were able to be preached to. Peter learned this, and they were, they were to be preached to, and Cornelius was one of those. And the people we read in verse 44 of Acts chapter 10, we read that the people in his house were baptized. Cornelius sought Peter. Peter sought him. And if we seek opportunities, we'll run into people that want the same thing that we want, a home in heaven someday. And that is the question. Do you seek opportunities to reach someone with your faith? As Philip did. As the Greeks were interested. Do you search for that pearl of great price in others? Do you search for others like Cornelius and Peter did, seeking after an opportunity even to just talk about Scripture? Who knows where that will lead? Just simply saying, hey, I read this good verse the other day. What do you think about that? And starting a conversation by that could lead to great things. You are encompassed by the enemy of sin, but for you, Jesus lived, died, He conquered the grave, and provided a way of escape. And now you have an opportunity. But what do you do with that opportunity? If you're not a Christian, I hope you'll make the most of it. 
Talk to me tonight. Talk to me after services. And let's baptize you into the body of Christ. Or if you are a Christian and have wandered away spiritually, come forward tonight and let us pray for you in that way as well so that those sins might be forgiven and that you might get back on the right path. Don't waste this opportunity right now as we stand and sing.